Good morning. I woke up late and the little guy got up early and he's sitting there playing on his Pokemon game. And he just interrupted already. I just started making a video and he came out. And I, I don't think his mom is comfortable being at him with him being on these videos. So, uh, and this is the only time during this whole day I'll have a chance to make something. So I'm going to try and do this really quickly. I want to review um, the life of o Olauda Equiano. Uh, which is a slave narrative that was first published in 1789 and um, the version I'm reading though is 1792 the version that I read um, and this is a this book is a signet classic compilation of four slave narratives um, edited by Henry Louis Gates jr um, so he begins his account of his childhood he was uh, from the Ig Igbo tribe in what he calls Guinea, but it was southern Nigeria. He was uh, kidnapped by fellow Africans who, you know, traded him up the coast. So he spent several months, uh, traded him to the coast. He spent several months just traveling and being like he stopped and was a slave for a couple of months in this village where they still spoke his language. And then he traveled some more and they were speaking a different language. And then finally he gets to the coast. He was kidnapped with his sister and they traveled a little bit together and then they were separated. But then when they got to the coast, I think, they were reunited for one night before they were torn apart. Um, he was 11 years old. He was the youngest of six children, I think. And his uh, father was a chieftain of their particular clan or whatever. Um, and the first part of the book's really interesting because he recounts what life was like, what he remembers as, as a young boy, what it was like and what their customs were. And, um, and he finds it, he really, when he later on learns, the, when he reads the Bible, he finds a striking similarity to the Israelites. For instance, they did circumcision, um, just the way the men and women were separated um, the sort of uh, emphasis on hygiene, um, all sorts of things he found uh, very similar. So um, after the kidnapping is, uh, people just come over the wall. They knew that there were a lot of kidnappers and they tried to prevent it. But one time they were caught off guard and people had gone to the uh, farm, the, the community farm where they raise food and he and his sister were at home and some people climb over the wall of their village to protect their village and kidnap them. And um, after he's taken to the coast, he's sold to white slavers. And you know, it's the first time he's seen white people and he's, he thinks they're really ugly. And he thinks that they're just, they must be ma you know evil spirits with magical powers. He's so traumatized and confused. And then he does the mid-Atlantic crossing where he's, um, you know, he witnesses so much horror and death and cruelty. And um, he gets to uh, the West Indies. My hair, I didn't even have a chance to comb my hair this morning because I just got up when the little guy came up. Anyway, so that's why I look so horrible. I'm just, I'm literally just taking the first sips of my coffee this morning. Um, anyway, he gets to the West Indies and he, he gets sold to a planter. He gets taken up to Virginia where he's sold to a planter. And the only memory he has of that is of having to be forced to a fan the man while he's sick and asleep. And he looks up and he, he's looking at a painting and he has, has never seen a painting like that of, of a human, you know, a portrait and uh, a clock. And so he's just, he's just in this fog of, of trauma and fear uh, and amazement, you know. Um, and and, and he, he just, as a young, I think it comes back later too, all the trauma that he experiences. Anyway, he does get sold to the sea captain and he winds up um, staying with him for eight years or something and he was kind to him and he had a nephew I believe named Dick who was 15 so by the time he gets to there he's to that guy Pascal he or Pascal I don't know how you say it. Um, <clears throat> he's 12 so he's befriended by the 15 year old and he, he learns English and they kind of teach him start to teach him to read they teach him a little bit of arithmetic and he starts loving being on a ship he becomes a sailor uh, he gets to the level of able seaman i think um, 
and uh, and then this is just before the Seven Years' War, and his master is a naval captain, and so he goes into battle, and he finds it really thrilling. He can't wait to get to an engagement and fight, and he's, he's really come to really identify uh, to a great degree with the, with the British over the course of those eight years. Um, and then his master, oh, he, he gets baptized. His master's, was it his cousins or his nieces or something? I can't remember now, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do this really quickly. Um, he gets baptized, they befriend him and they're really kind to him. And then his master double crosses him because he thought with the prize money he'd be able to buy his freedom. And the master so, uh, sells him before they can get back to London to, or just as they get back to London, before he can go in and collect his prize money. He's horribly betrayed, he feels terrible. Um, and he's he, he doesn't want to go to the West Indies because that's where the it, that was like the worst place to go because the it was incredibly cruel. So he winds up going to the West Indies, but he gets sold to the Quaker Dr. King, who um, is actually known for being kinder f to his slaves. So um, his first master had said to the guy who was going to take him back to the West Indies. You got to find the best master for him. So that was his little nice thing. Um, so anyway, so under that guy, um, he has all sorts of adventures because then he gets kind of lent out to a, a captain that works for that guy. Um, and he sails all over the place and shipwrecked and he goes to Savannah and uh, Charles, he calls it Charlestown to Charleston and uh, Philadelphia. So they, he saw, sells all over the place, all sorts of adventures. He witnessed all kinds of cruelty. He himself is taken advantage of and treated very, very, uh, in very, very dehumanizing ways. And then he finally, uh, he trades, like he'll go to one island and he'll buy up things like lemons and limes that are a little bit cheaper there and then he'll go sell them for a few more, you know, for a small, a smaller, a small amount more at another island, things like that. He buys trinkets and things and he, and he um, sells things. And he slowly, 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 and he gets raw up sometimes and all sorts of things happen, but he finally gets enough money to buy his freedom. And he's got to negotiate for that and then he gets his freedom. But while he's free, it takes him a couple of years. He really wants to go back to London because that's the um, place that he remembers being the happiest. And uh, it takes him a while, he has a lot more adventures. Um, and then he gets back to London, and he's also been taught to be a hairdresser, which is what I need right now, um, on board the ship. And so he apprentices in London, and he becomes a hairdresser, he learns the French horn, he studies arithmetic more, um, he's, he's, you know, he's fairly happy, but then he gets, you know, wanderlust again. He's used to sailing and moving and adventure, so he keeps... So he's got this tension going on where he likes being at home in London, he likes to be in London um, and have sort of a quiet life, or he goes off um, on adventures. Uh, but the, here's the thing that really got me. He was free and he was talking about how cruel slavery was and everything, but he would, he would opt to become a uh, work on a ship that was carrying slaves. And in fact, at one point, he's, he's working for this guy, Dr. Irving, who invented a distillery from making um, seawater into drinking water. And he, um, he agrees to be his overseer. So they go to the Mosquito Coast, which is uh, the coast of Venezuela, I think. And they're gonna start a plantation there and he's gonna be an overseer for the slaves. And his justification for it is that he's gonna be kind to the slaves. So. It's a weird thing. The other thing that was weird about this book is he never tried to go back home to find his family. Instead, I mean, much later, um, after he's gone through all these adventures and he's really become a devout Christian, he, um, he is gonna become a missionary to Sierra Leone, which is not the area where he was from. But they kind of scam him. They take all the money that they raised for the uh, for the trip and it the trip never comes off so he gets scammed i maybe later in his life after this he no i don't think so anyway i found it 
extremely interesting. It's it's not just a slave narrative. It's really kind of a, a lot of history of sailing at the time and naval warfare and that sort of thing. So it's a real it's a real slice of history. And, and you know, if you like reading Master and Commander or the Horatio Hornblower type books, um, you you know you can enjoy it for that reason as well. <clears throat> um, but I don't understand. You know, he and he wrote this narrative um, in an attempt to abolish the slave trade. So in England, the slave trade itself got abolished in 1807, 10 years after he died. But he was working on it he, with a bunch of other abolitionists. Um, and he wrote this to Parliament. Um, and, um, and then it was abolished in all the colonies. Actual slavery was abolished in 1833, and that was William Wilberforce. So um, he, he has lots of adventures. One of them is they're going, they go to what he calls the North Pole. They go up towards the Arctic to try to find a passage around the top of Russia, I think. That's what I could figure out to go around to India. Didn't work. They got stuck in the ice. It was, he almost died. He has so many near brushes with death. Um, but that was the one that really traumatized him. I, I feel like it, it brought up all the trauma that he'd ever had in his life. And he goes into depression. And that's when he becomes sort of a fanatical Christian. And he's so odd. Like he's fixated on blaspheming. So he, he literally, of his own free will, hires himself out to be a steward on ships carrying slaves. And yet he gets disgusted because people keep taking the Lord's name in vain. Like that's the thing that puts him over the edge. That he, it's just, I found him odd. And I think it's because I have a modern perspective because he admits that his father had slaves. It made me think, it really made me think two things. One, and this is why I'm wearing this t-shirt, um, that slavery has always been with us. It's not just an American phenomenon. Although the particular pernicious, really cruel version of, of slavery that we had that got racialized, um, that was a particularly terrible form of it. But still, it's all terrible. And it's been with us since the beginning of time. And, you know, it's, it's I mean, I'm Christian. It's, we fell, you know, we're fallen. We're fallen sinners. And we got kicked out of the Garden of Eden, figuratively speaking. And, you know, so things aren't perfect and uh, for sure and one way that people got around the need for intensive labor arduous labor was they they took slaves and so you know back in the olden days when your when your tribe or your city state or whatever it was went to war with the other city state or tribe or whatever and you won the people that you didn't kill you took home as slaves and it happened everywhere slavery was just a it's pretty much a constant. I mean, Native Americans took slaves of other Native Americans. Africans took slaves of other African people. Um, you know, Egypt, Greece, Rome, and I'm sure in other countries too, you know, like the Aztecs, everybody had slaves. Um, and it was just this horrible aspect of human society. And so, uh, so it isn't just, I think a lot of times when people talk about in America, it's like we're the only ones that ever did this. Most of the slaves in the slave trade went to Brazil. I don't know how it, how things happened in Brazil. Like, what's it like there now? But, but the vast majority went there um, from this slave trade, from the Africa, West African slave trade. Um, so, you know, it's been a thing that's been with us. And in fact, I'm wearing this t-shirt because I'm not virtue signaling. I actually did a 5K to um, raise awareness and um, earn money. I walked, I didn't run, um, for the um, Operation Underground Railroad because there is human trafficking today. It's not the same chattel slavery, but there is a horrible, huge, beyond comprehension actually, problem with human trafficking today. We still have slavery with us. And you know what? We're all complicit in it. We really are because we have this complex supply chain and everyone's making stuff for us in the developed world to consume. And we don't know where that stuff comes from. And a lot of times it's involved. It involves slavery. 
we buy stuff like when we the minerals or whatever we need for um, our electronics they they could be come from you know enslaved people mining that stuff for us um, chocolate is an example that I always think about because the little boy his mother is from Cote d'Ivoire which used to be the number one chocolate um, source in, in uh, the world there's they it's slaves who harvest our, our chocolate so we can have it cheap I mean, if you buy Hershey's chocolate or Nestle's chocolate, you're probably buying chocolate that that it involves slavery. And there's so many other things, so, so many other things. Who butchers your fast food chicken? It's probably a slave. I, it, there's so, and, and I won't even get into sex trafficking. The, the porn industry is this billion dollar global industry driven by sex trafficking, by slavery. So it's rampant today you know we aren't any better we aren't any better people so when we look back and I mean I'm all for taking the Confederate statues down because I'm I think we're allowed to redecorate you know and if we, we're tired of, of honoring these Confederates that's fine with me I think people go too far and they want to take down every statue of everybody and I think that's I don't think they have the ability to discern where you know what's reasonable and what isn't, what's iconoclasm. But um, but on the other hand, we are no better. We are no better. We're all sinners and fall short of the glory of God, and and we're still doing it. Um, but that's not to diminish the the special evil of the American version of slavery and all the fallout and harm that it's caused um, because it was mixed with racism but this was a very very interesting um, book I think I started to say this when he goes to the North Pole he sees seahorses and they shoot seahorses what animal was that I was really curious about that um, anyway it was a very interesting account I can't keep talking because I don't know where the oh my gosh it's 17 minutes already this is too much of a topic for me to rush through. So, but I, I'm not gonna have any other time to do it. And I just wanted to, to have closure so I can move on to other books. Um, so anyway, so that is my very, probably very incoherent review of um, the life of Alato Equiano. Oh, and his, his first real long-term master gave him the name Gustavus. Vasa. So that was the name he eventually accepted. Um, because apparently there was this thing where they would name their slaves after leaders and Gustavus Vasa was some great Danish king or something. Um, anyway, uh, but I, I also, last thing, is I discovered a really good website on this called Equiano's World. It's a history project by, the, by York University in Toronto really well done and it gave a lot of background um, so I could understand what was going on better. But a very neat book, Jennifer Brooks said in the comments when I put this on my TBR for Jane Austen July that I would love it and I did, I really enjoyed it. It just took me a really long time to read it because so much was going on and the print was so tiny and my eyes were so bad. Anyway, uh, hi, okay, he, he's ready for me to stop so I'll talk to you later. Bye.